go over them again. I want to go over them again. So um, I'll send them to you all. I'll, like I said, when I send it to you, it's going to be tentatively that um, that's your result. Okay. But I did mark the papers. Yeah. Like I say, um, there's still um, two other persons who will has to take the exam. Yeah. So, but the persons who papers had marked, I'll send you all the results. Like I say, it's I'm gonna go back over it because I want to ensure that because I know with the assignments, a couple of people have been coming back to see, oh Miss Smith, I get that answer. So I want to make sure I get the, you know, make sure I got the correct marking um, grades for each person. Okay. Yeah, but after class, I'll send the results out to persons and saying that I still going over it. So Monday by Monday, I should be completed. So I'll send them to y'all on the weekend. So Monday, you know, questions, we can talk about it, but I make sure like some persons the person who got 98, um, put the question, would they, would they answer it and say why the question was wrong? Because even though they said to me that um, this should be what it should be, but that's not the question that I asked. So, but it's true or false, yeah. Mm -hmm. But like I say, nobody failed. So only two more persons to take it. And so we'll go from there, but we're going to try to finish at least both chapters, because as you know, um, like I told you, the exam is only going to be, the final is only going to be on chapter 7 to 12, I think. It's 12 chapters, right? 7 to 12. So we have to make sure it gets, you know, because next week we have two class, and I think the following week there. Yeah. But so we just have to try to get ahead. So, because you know, the final grade is 50%. The term is 30, but the final is 50%. So, you know, you have to do well. And like we know with the certificate course, like I say, a 64 is a fail. So you have to get- Well, the final, mm -hmm. sorry. Huh? Will the final exam be structured just like uh, the midterm exam? Yes, ma'am. I don't go out the box and try to do. I used to give essays and stuff, but I know with multiple choice, you either right or wrong, true and false, you either you either right or wrong. So if you read, then I know even if you, you take the questions that I give you, you have to go to the book to read to find them. So yeah, so I prefer multiple choice. Like I said, when I first started teaching, you know, I used to give essay short answers. When I had 20 persons in my class and I had to mark all of those, I realized that uh -uh, I can't do that. So I learned. Uh, the, the persons who used to teach before, they used to do multiple choice before me, try to decide to do something different. I had to switch back to the multiple choice. And as we know, most external exams are multiple choice. Like if you do the CIA and stuff like that, a lot of them are, you know, multiple choice. Yeah. Alrighty. So chapter eight talks about retail banking channels. Um, it tells us that legacy system, it talks about Although technology has been, has developed at a rapid pace and startup banks can take full advantage of it to the extent that budgets allow. Many banks formed in the 20th century experience problems emanating from legacy system. And um, when they say legacy, we know that's them system that's been around from then. As, as you see here, they're talking about the 1940s. That is systems developed in the early era are not necessarily equipped to deal with modern demands. Um, in 1940, in the UK, a customer buying statement would be written by hand. As we know, back in the days too, not too long ago, we had 
where we had hair buying books and buying books a lot of times. Some banks had where you, they insert it in the machine and it prints it off. And then some banks, they still were handwriting it. So yes, when they talk about legacy, that's back in the long days, back in those days. So hand or type directly from a hard copy ledger held within the branch. And two, remember back in the days, uh, well, some people still do the bookkeeping. So they still keep those ledgers, those bookkeeping ledgers for, for different stuff. So they still keep their ledgers. Some people still do. Um, but nowadays you have QuickBooks, you have all kinds of different software that you can use for accounting and you know inventory for expenses, all kinds of software that you can use for that. Um, in the 1940s, like I say, they handwrite in ledgers, request a statement or even a check, a check cashing facility at a location other than a branch at which a customer held their accounts with Frigid were delayed and uncertainty. In the 1960s and 70s, bank invested heavily in a computer system. And even though we have technology today, still technology is good, and it's bad in a way because hey, for us who totally depend on Kate, um, Web and BTC when it comes to the internet being up, because if you work from home and the internet is not up, you can't do anything. So, you know, technology is good and it is bad because like you, you can have glitches and you can have things that happen and create a whole disaster. So it's good and it's bad. So back in the days, they invested in, in the 1960s, 70s, they invested heavily in computer systems to support their operations. Such system was designed to support traditional branch and product-based banking, particularly partly because of increasing number of customers, but also to try to, to mitigate practical, to mitigate the overall cost and to improve the flexibility of the branch day system. By the 1970s then, branch ledgers had been replaced by central computer system that recorded the same basic information. By the 1990s, however, the computer systems of the 1970s was obsolete. Yeah, because remember they had those big old computers that the, 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 the big monitor, like how they had those big TVs. So that's how they were then, those, those really, really, really back in the days computers. Even when I was working at, in, in started working at the bind, those systems were still there. Then they eventually phased them out, you know, phased them out. Such system has constantly had to be upgraded, updated and updated at a huge expense as new business models and techno technological um, advances have emerged. Legacy systems are seen as barriers to exit, exit from the industry because they have values only in the term of their capacities to generate revenue, profit rather than as asset in their own right. And then you'd see down here, they showed you in the delivery system, how it works. Um, so you'd see the products and you see loans, personal financing, current account, savings account, your customer going into the branch, you have head office, funding, management, credit control, market system. So these, this is what um, figure eight one is showing. The key point is made, however, that a branch was the sole interface between the bank and most of its customers and was required to cater more for more most for most businesses and credit decisions. It was managed by a respective a respected senior staff member with a salary and remuneration package comments com compensated with their personal status and responsibility as it was as will illustrated in a series of pictures published online by Telegraph in 2003. 
And like I say, back in the days too, they had telegrams, telegraph, they were the things that was actually being used. Though in the 1970s, the bank head office provided funding, product design and marketing and legal services while branches operated at a, as a franchise. The branch manager was the master of all. He surveyed the first woman branched manager was not appointed until 1958 running the branch as an individual business with little interference from head office um back in the days like you see women used to run the branch too so not until 1958 that uh, actual woman run the branch without interference from head office and we know head office and they usually interferes um, with, they have to have the final say, some branch managers have free will that they could do certain things, they get a pool of certain things, but at the end of the day, head office dictates a lot of stuff to um, the branches. Uh, management, you'd have the board, you'd have um, the executive officer, stuff like that. They actually dictate to the branch what should happen. If something is going on in the branch first, with anything, um, the branch manager has to ensure that head office is notified as what is going on. Um, I remember working in the branch um, and there was a robbery in progress and my boss, I was sitting in her office and all I remember the guy coming over the counter and I was like, no, we can't be getting robbed first thing on a Monday morning. And she looks at me and she said, call head office. I looked at her and I was like, you see the blinds open, this fellow with a gun, and you're telling me reach over there to call on the phone. So everything right then, we had to report to head office that, hey, we're being robbed. So like I say, head office is, um, they may say they had little interference, but head office is still where the, at the point where head office still interferes. They still make decisions for the branches. They still dictate certain things that the branches can or cannot do. Originally, a secret project named Project Rain Cloud first direct was launched under the auspice of Midland Bank, later HSBC. So you see, that's what HSBC was called um, in the 1989. It was the first telephone bank and remain the most successful to date. It grew swiftly achieving 100,000 customers account by 1991 and 250 by 1993. So behind the scenes, however, First Direct had been designed as an erroneous branch using Midland by later HSBC branch to take deposit automatic telemachine ATMs in Midland, access to checks and credit clearing, along with a sophisticated telephone system call center to interface with customers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Do we have that at any of, um, Scotia, do you have anything like that? Um, you all have a call center that persons can, I know, um, if I call a Royal Bank, um, they, they have a call center, but it's not from in the Bahamas. I think it's Trinidad or Jamaica answers. Do you have that at Scotia? Yeah, we have one in um, Trinidad. Okay, yeah, because I know you can call, but boy, it's been on that phone so long, don't, let, don't never miss and let something happen to your online banking and you gotta, you, you miss your password and you gotta call. You'll be calling forever before you get through to someone, yeah. While other banks initially hesitated in their response to first direct success, by 1992, banks had began to transform in other ways at, at the next session will illustrate Delivery system. The different delivery system available for buying products and interaction are described here roughly chronologically order of appearance. 
and then it says in chapter 10, I guess we'll talk about more, talking about the payment system. Okay, and we go on to see where they talked about Jesse James. Okay, the different type of physical security risks are also apparent. For example, buying branches and logic, logistics used to serve them were a clear target for armed robbery from the days of Jesse James in the US while west to the great train robberies in 1963 and the Brickmark robbery exactly 20 years later. In the 21st century, these types of risks are made uh, much reduced, but the focus is now on cybercrime, identified theft, plastic cards, fraud, regardless of the type of risk, however, one of one thing remain constant. It is the bank that has to swallow the losses and which much must therefore extend every effort to avoid or at least reduce risk. And like we know with, with, with anything, as long as you open a business, um, there's risk because um, persons taken out, persons looking to say, oh, they open a business, they have any security, that security get any gun, no, no, any cameras. And so, you know, robberies is like you walk down the road and or stop in your car and back here in our home, you stop in the car, the fellas could tap on your glass and say, get out the car that's there. So, you know, it, it's just like mitigating robberies is not an easy thing because um, you could put everything in place. You could put cameras, you could have a security guard, you could have buzzer to buzz people in, people come in, they come clean cut and they could be a robber. So, you know, it's just, um, that's why banks have everything insured. So when, when a, there's a bank robbery or something happened in a bank or somebody stole, the bank is not at loss because they're insured for those stuff. And, and that's why you see like I am working in, in, the, in the branches. Um, when you see peak seasons, like a Christmas, like a, coming back to school, like vacations when people get in a lot of loans and stuff like that, you'd see that um, the bank, especially Christmas and breaks that, you know, people shop a lot. The banks would not just, they double that insurance, that insurance is no longer just what they would ordinarily have because they have to um, upload the ATM with much more because people shopping. So because they, if their limit used to be 100,000 for any given day for one machine and then the next machine, they have to upload more because people shopping and before you know it, government payday, everybody then take all the money. So with them uploading more, they have to get approval from the insurance company and they upgrade their insurance. So the bank is never at loss because they have the money insured. So if there's a robbery, if there's fraud, the money is insured. So the bank is not at loss. Branches, when I talk about branches, we know back here, like I talked before, back here we have branches. We have some banks have several branches. How many more branches y'all have in, in, in the in, well, in Nassau now that is actually where customers could still go in? Mr. Price? I believe we have um, six other yeah. branches in the bottom, it's in Nassau. Mm -hmm. They'll have yeah. them on, on the um. Uh, you 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 have them where you have you, no more on Exuma, right? No, the the only family island or well, only other island where we have a branch is would would be Freeport. That's it. So it's just not on Freeport. Oh, okay. yeah. Have their Yeah. All right. So like I say, um before they had branches to accommodate a lot of customers. But like I say, now they're trying to, the banks are trying to trend that down because they prefer people to do things online, go to the ATM, because most times you get in the bank, you have the ATM card, but why are you on this line? Yeah, so they're trying to get customers to actually, nowadays to actually use the ATM, use online banking. In the UK in the mid 20th century, 
Vine Branch was a common feature in the town center and high streets. About 20% of the floor space within a typical Vine Branch was reserved for customers, with the remaining 80% set aside to accommodate processing systems for payment securities and lending clerks, storage spaces for old checks and records and staff rest area. Although the shared, the shared, the shared from public view, each branch would also include the bank vault and the cash safe, typically a basement in accordance with, with technologies. But like we know, all branch have this, they have a, a vault. And then I, when I used to work in the bank, we used to call it a book vault where we kept all transactions, kept all the stuff like they say with checks, signature cards, all of that used to be stored in the book vault. Yeah, and the cash vault dealt with a lot of cash, dealt with teller's compartment, dealt with treasury, um, dealt with securities where you keep combination envelopes, common, um, where, you can, where you get stamps that were not being used. You can, so these were keys, all of these had different compartments. Like when I worked in the bank, they call it securities. So all the keys and stamps, unused stuff were kept in securities. Uh, the teller is gone. The combination envelope is now put on stock. And so they were stuff like that that actually were actually kept in the book vault, in the cash vault. Those stuff were kept in the cash vault. So um, the, the, the security depart compartment, treasury kept the, 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 the full amount of the money where each teller had their own compartment. Is it the, still the same way, Mr. Price? Because I know you're in operation. Hi, Mr. Price. Y'all still have a cash vault and a book vault? Sorry, yes, we, we still have a cash vault. Um, not sure what the book vault is, but we only have one vault um, where we store the cash and other negotiable items. We still have compartments where each, each CSR has their own compartments or that's all phased out? No, we, we still, well, some of the branches, um, we have cash branches and non-cash branches. So the cash branches, they would still have um, various compartments for different um, cash customer service offices. As I know, like a RBC, those ones who use the teller machine, eh? y'all don't use the teller machine to dispense cash. Eh? So we still pretty much manual there. Today, um, okay, where am I? So Midland Bank pioneer outsourcing of paper checks and credit processing from branches in 1989 to 1991, the district service centers later sold to independent operators was echoed by other institutions as transformation of bank branches began. So you'd see in the 1989, 1991, branches transformation started to evolve. Today, typical bank branch are far more customer oriented. Is that so? Typical bank branch, is they far more customer oriented? I don't think so, because like I say, they're trying to get you not to come in the branch. And like you have like um, some banks like Scotia, um, Ms. Price said that um, they, customers don't come in the bank anymore for loans and stuff like that. So it's, I guess they're just trying to, you know, ease the process instead of persons having to find somewhere to park, running late for the appointment, you know. So I, I, to me, I guess it's better when um, you can just do everything online. An almost reverse the staff customer, customer ratio so that 80% of the center of the floor space is available to customers in open planning, open plan setting for ATM transactions. 
interviews and formal and informal interaction with staff. And so, like I say, that was back in the days. Nowadays, it's more being um, trying to be more proactive with allowing customers to be able to do stuff online. And so that to me is good because um, like I say, you're not able to always be able to get downtown and downtown you never could find no parking because you gotta go park in the financial center and the minute you pull in there, it's $8.25 and every hour after that, it, I see three dollars and something. So, yeah. So I think that's a good thing when you can do all your transactions online. I mean, you're you want to get a loan, you can actually do everything online. So that's a good thing. And then they talk about the ATMs. Can Miss Russell? Can you pick up from there for me, please? The ATM teller machine, the automated teller machine. Automated teller machines um, have been in existence since the early 1960s and have advanced as technologies for plastic cards and telecommunications have developed over the decades. The modern ATM carries out a number of functions, including the following withdrawing cash, depositing checks and cash, checking balances, printing or requesting bank statements, topping up mobile phones, making transfers between predetermined accounts and loading credit onto stored value cards. As with bank branches, the international picture is varied. Figure 8.3 illustrates numbers of ATMs per 100,000 adults in selected territories around the world. Once again, it is evident that high-income countries have a higher prevalence of ATMs, but like branch numbers per head, the trend in these countries is towards declining coverage as new delivery methods are adopted. In lower and middle-income countries, Meanwhile, ATM coverage is increasing. Once again, Singapore and New Zealand are anomalies as higher income countries in which ATM coverage has increased. But, is, but it is important to remember when making these comparisons that the ATMs in more developed countries may have greater functionality than those in less developed territories. Operators of ATMs normally ensures that the machines are situated in well-lit places and give clear warnings to users not to allow their transactions to be overlooked and to be vigilant for fraudulent devices that may be attached to the machines. 20 years ago, all ATMs were situated out of doors. The redesign of retail branches means that some have migrated indoors where transactions can be completely completed more safely. In the 21st century, ATMs are no longer the sole preserve of banks. Cash handling companies quickly saw the value of installing their own machines at non-bank locations, such as supermarkets, airports, motorway service areas. The business model was simple. A non-bank provider charges a fee for the use of its ATMs. For independent operators, this is the main source of revenue. For some banks, this covers the cost of data transmission to the cardholders' banks and the lost interest on money held as cash. Figure 8.4 illustrates the relatively straightforward ATM system regardless of whether the machine is situated at a bank branch or off-site or is operated by an independent company. Okay, so, so we see it. Sorry? Okay, one second. As we see, we see the, data, the transaction data, the ATM operator, the bank or the company. So it's laid out here to show you how everything works. You can go ahead, Ms. Russell. The ubiquity of cards, games, Visa, MasterCard, C Chapter 9 has also allowed cooperation between banks, allowing customers of one bank to access limited services via the ATMs of another bank, even internationally. In these instances, fees are often waived in domestic markets but apply for international transactions. The key risk in relation to ATM transactions relates to the cloning of card details by means of sophisticated scanners and cameras that criminals attached to machines. Although the customer is asked to be vigilant, these devices are often mini mini miniaturized and well concealed. Once card data is read, the criminal can use the clone card buy goods or withdraw cash until the cardholder realizes that there is a problem and reports it to the bank. 
queuing problems at ATMs and retailers are also cited as opportunities for thieves. Cardholders need to shield their personal identification numbers from the various passers passers by. For pin, for once the pin has been obtained, the card can be stolen and used until reported loss. Banks and technology providers try to remain ahead of the game, and the recent linking of mobile phone banking and ATMs may be one way of doing so. Using a smartphone, the customer orders a withdrawal at an ATM and then is sent a unique pin with which to withdraw cash within a specific time limit. If this method proves popular, plastic cards will continue to be used, but the smartphone application would add a level of encryption and security that criminals will find hard to replicate. Thank you. So, I, I like we talked about ATM cards before. I like we know ATM cards, like I say, we can be used around the world so I can go anywhere and use my card. It's just that I got to pay that fee. And in, in the, all different countries, the fees seem to be different. So, you go to Canada, you go to the US, and the first thing it's going to say to you when you want to do a withdrawal from the ATM is going to ask you, Are you willing to accept the charges? This is the charge. Are you, do you agree? Yes or no? So if you say no, it spits your card back out because you don't want to pay the fee, so you can't get the money. Um, yes, yeah, so any questions, any concern, anything anybody want to add to this area? ATM? Just devote. No, no it's a straight forward. Okay. Um, now we have phone banking. Um, Ms. Devo, can you um, read phone banking for me, please? Sure. Phone banking. At one level, phone banking simply replaced the bank branch with a call handling center that is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The early pioneers of this in the UK was First direct C legacy system in 1989. Although the basic idea really originated in the mail order catalog business in the United States. One critical difference between face to face branch banking and telephone banking and its modern equivalents is the need to identify the caller. Advanced Advances that made direct banking possible could not, however, overcome one of the basic bank duties to its customers, confidentiality. Phone banking meets this issue in three ways as follows. Number one, customers establish password at the onset of the relationship, such as, um, such as more memorable words, more memorable dates, or the answers to a pre terminated questions such as what was the name of your first pet? Second, phone banking contracts are agreed with customers so that the customer share responsibility for keeping security codes and password undisclosed. Third, because they may be overheard, callers are asked only for certain letters, for them a memorable word, words or passwords. Phone banking use what are term inbound call. Inbound call centers operated either directly by a bank or outsourced. Inbound centers offer product support, query re resolution, and processes more sophisticated loan application. Banks also use outward call centers, but these are sales mechanism rather than a delivery channel. Early call centers in the UK were UK based staff by trained employees and able to offer a trigger service whereby the service for the calls could be swiftly identified and the caller then diverted to an appropriate supervisor or functional area. First Direct still operates in this way with calls in Leeds and in Scotland, HSBC. Its parents company used its own centers located in different parts of the world. Customers call from the UK, for example, are routed to HSBC, Malta, where HSBC employs well-educated English-speaking staff at low cost than it, than it could 
in the UK. Different UK banks operate via independently call centers, either domestically in the UK or overseas in India, South East Asia or Eastern Europe. These centers most, sorry, these centers must balance cost against customer satisfaction, but can offer specialization economies of scale and synergies for banks and customers alike. One interesting findings in relation, in relation to the use of call centers has been that UK customers favor certain region accents, leading to a clustering of call centers in the northeast of the country. Newcastle and North Hammerbrook, as well as Scotland and Ireland. Routers, 2009. Other cultural factors are also important in the choice of location and have in recent years resulted in migration away from India, for example, to Europe for buying space in the European Union. Thank you. Um, like we see here, and like we know, um, all banks have call centers and most of our, well, we say phone banking, but it's the same thing like, like I said before, if we um, have to change our password because we can't get into our banking system, um, we have to call, we have the call center and these call centers are managed by, like they say, um, HSBC had um, English speaking persons, but you know, we, we have to call these call centers and sometimes boys don't even understand what they say. And I, I have to be asking you to repeat yourself and they'd be like getting a little annoyed, but I, I understand you. And so that's what I never understood about how come all the bank, well, more Canadian banks are, they are out, everything is outsourced to um, not here, but in Trinidad or Jamaica. Um, and like I say, with phone banking, back in the days, they had that, I think I remember Finco had it and you had to call, put in your password, um, like, they, like it said before, different characters in, 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 in um, different letters in, in probably if they ask you what your pet name is, yeah. So I remember phone banking, Finco had it and I used to have, I, I used it, so yeah. That's phone banking. We all know about online banking, which has now become a hip because most, I mean, most persons actually use it because you can, I, I, I'm not sure, Mr. Price, um, uh, with y'all online banking, are y'all uh, able to transfer internationally or just domestically and um, customer to customer or between accounts? Are y'all able to transfer internationally? No, not as yet. Um, it's just domestic for now. I, I believe that they are in the progress of um, enabling that function soon. Because I know um, a lot of banks don't seem to be able to do that international transaction. You can transfer domestic and between accounts and customer by customer, but um, international, no, that's not happening. And so like I say, internet, um, online banking is something now that is actually really being used. A lot of people use it um, because it's easier because instead of me having to go and stand on the line and put some money on your account, I can easily get your account, your branch, your, your transit number. Um, you know, because some, when you call up some accounts when you're doing from some brand, some banks, when you're doing a transfer to another customer's account at another bank, some um, banks, it was when you pull up the information on your online bank and it'll say, um, it'll actually, if you, you're trying to transfer to RBC, it'll say, it, it drops down and show you all the different branches. And then I guess some branch, some banks have it where the transit code is there. So you have to make sure and sure you know that transit code, because if you don't, I know of a situation with somebody was transferring some money to me and she totally got the transit code wrong and the money went to and, and, and she got the branch wrong and the money went to someone else's account and I'm like hold on but she didn't pay your rent eh? so I called the girl I said hey 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 you'll pay your rent she's like yes I did 
I say, well, it surely didn't come to my account because I had it to send from her account at Fidelity to my account at RBC and she put in the wrong transit number that went to somebody else's account. And believe it, I didn't even notice it until the second month, it was like when I went. And that's when I realized, I said, hold on, hold on, what's happening here? Then when, when we looked at it and I went back to, to the bank because I worked there, so they would give me the information. They said, no, the wrong transit. So it went to the wrong customer account number at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the bank. And it took me, must be two months before I get my money, you know, because apparently the person take the money off, but the person did not have no money. So it, it was like, so you have to be very careful when you say I'm transferring money to domestically to another, another bank. You have to ensure you have all the correct information, that transit number, ensure, make sure the numbers they giving you that say when you go, usually I know in some, like it'll show the hour, the little um, magnifying glass. So if you click on that, it'll, it'll bring up the, it'll say savings and it'll bring up, once you put in the account number, it automatically bring up the customer name and everything. So you know, hey, yeah, I'm at the right, this is the right customer. So you have to be actually very, very, very careful when transferring money to another bank. Ensure that you get all the information because if they say, oh, it's just going to um, Commonwealth Bank Oaksville, you know, in the drop down button, it has Commonwealth Bank Oaksville, you put it in, then you put in the customer account number and, and you go from there. So like I said, it's just being very careful with doing it, just like anything. If like you're paying a bill, you have to ensure that you know the actual um, account number is correct because you could have another customer with just a digit off of what you have, and you want to pay that person bill. So at, at the top, you see where they 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 have um, web present customer contact, interactive PC banking, home banking, multi-platform global banking. And so the first breakthrough came in 1990 with home banking, allowing customers and businesses that had telephone link, personal computer PC to access and interact with their bank records. That is to check their balances, make transfer between accounts and to make predetermined bill payment. This has evolved into functionality that embraces internet and smartphones interaction loan application and the majority of tasks previously performed by the bank staff in traditional branches or wire phone banking. And I gave, we would have seen that in chapter six. And then we have mobile banking. Mr. Price, can you um, read mobile banking for me please? Mobile banking, mobile phone banking, as with the internet, smartphone banking has developed in tandem with the relevant technology. Voice calls using uh, mobile phones can clearly be seen as a subset of phone or direct banking. The expansion of text messaging facilitated the offering of balance and credit limits alert. Notification that an item, if paid, would exceed an agreed credit limit gives the customer an opportunity to transfer funds from elsewhere to meet the cost of the item and to avoid incurring charges for unauthorized overdraft. Mobile phone payment systems are examined in more detail in chapter 10. Here, we will illustrate the expansion of internet banking into smartphone application functionality. Apps allow users to perform a variety of tasks that can, that can also be executed online via PC or smartphone. Although banks use this channel, non-bank competitors such as companies offering short-term consumer loans, that is payday loans, have been swift to adopt the adopted bulk for advertising and facilitate customers' loan applications. It should also be noted that mobile phones are included here as a separate delivery channel because they offer opportunities for banks and non-banks 
to compete and to offer services in areas that are served well by mobile phone networks, but not by banking networks such as Sub-Saharan Africa, Rural Communities and Developing Nations, World Development Indicators 2016. You want me to continue? Yes, please. Okay, so the balance channel portfolio. Um, we have now come to a point at which various chapters are starting to converge. Consider the variety of banker to customer interaction described in chapter seven and the list of bank products and services described in chapter eight. We will also go on to examine the system support and the payment transactions as seen in chapter 10 and those deployed to grant credit, especially consumers as seen in chapter 11. While different banking channels often have different features delivering the same functionality and outcomes, many full service retail banks offer a complete range of channels to respond sensitively to the different preferences of their customers. Figure 8.6 illustrates the channel preferences of two exam example customers, Alice, which is A, and Betty, which is B. Alice is 35 years old and a busy professional she is confident transacting business via the internet and finds it convenient to do so when, when on the move or at weekends. However, when Alice wants to discuss more complex products such as pensions or life assurance, she prefers to meet face-to-face -face in a branch office. Betty is in her 70s, more traditional in her preferences and lifestyle. She enjoys the personal contact with staff at a branch and is not confident online. Personal preferences change over time. However, Al Alice may recall that when she was a 20 year old student, her preference profile looked exactly like Betty's. Getting the channel mix right, getting the channel mix right is therefore important for a retail bank. Design will be based not only on costs and efficiencies, but also the customer base, age, profiles, confidence levels, and product complexity parameters. Thank you. Yeah, so I can say they, they, they compared the older and the younger, kind of like Alice, when she was um, Betty, say she preferred the same stuff. Ms. Price, um, are you able to um, read the other bank operations in the 21st century for me, please? Mrs. Price. No problem. The retail bank in the 21st century <clears throat> has clear objectives to serve the interests of its shareholders, mainly in terms of return on equity or ROE within a complex and changing environment. Bank operations can be seen as a necessary cost of being a retail bank but they are a cost that can be minimized without a significant deterioration in service quality. The key factor that drives the operational design of the 21st century bank, however, is not cost or preferences or products, but recognition of what banking is all about. In chapter two, we outline core function of the bank as financial intermediation. In chapter three, we went on to describe what will generally be included on a bank balance sheet. What cannot be quantified so easily, however, is the asset value of information. Banks create, hold, analyze, and use information about their customers as readily as they hold and use deposits of money. Considering comparison with figure 8.1 at the start of this chapter, Figure 8.7, illustrating the modern retail bank, which recognizes that customer information rather than banking products and services are at the center of operational design. In the 21st century, the bank branch is simply one of a number of different channels through which customers can access services. Head office functions add an analytical dimension to customer information and allow for targeted marketing and the proactive design of existing and new systems. The bank's retention of data on interactions at both market and individual levels thus aids its product and operational design 
facilitates business planning and provides it with flexibility and a chance to update legacy systems in a way that does not damage business relationships. One final source of benefit to the 21st century bank is the recognition that it does not itself have to provide an in-house all of the services and functions on which its business relies. Some non-core functions can be outsourced or sourced via shared service, service centers. Figure 8.8 .8 illustrates the functions of a retail bank that have been described in this book and suggests that many of these could be outsourced to create what Llewellyn 1996-167 calls a virtual bank. As far as the customer is concerned, the bank is the same as it has always been, but behind the scenes, key processes and functions are carried out by outside bodies. A number of the outsourced functions relate to rout routine and frequent operations, such as payment transactions and credit scoring, bought in from credit reference agencies. The figure shows that data management, premises management, and maintenance of the website are performed in-house. But this is not a fixed rule. Any or all of these functions can be outsourced. What is left for the retail bank is the pure heart of banking, risk management. As we have seen, regulation recognizes a number of risk areas for banks. Simply outsourcing supply of functions to providers does not eliminate risk, but it can help a bank to manage and minimize it because each party shares risk and takes rewards. Outsourcing can also introduce new risks such as agency risk, a corollary to using a third party to deliver bank branded services, but that discussion is beyond the scope of this book. In the next chapter, we examine a subject to which we have already made frequent reference, payments and the payment system. Thank you. So we see this chapter dealt with retail banking channels. So um, now the next chapter deals with payment system. I also have my book. I promise to, I have my book and um, it also talks about payment and payment system, but I will insert that in later in as we go through this chapter, because it's not a very um, lengthy chapter, so we can go through it. Because what I want to insert in this chapter, I want to talk about the um, automated housing that the ACH that we have now that deals with um, our um, checking our clearinghouse, the Bahamas Automated Clearinghouse. I want to talk about that, so I'll inject that in there and talk about that. But I want to go on to chapter eight. Chapter nine, payment and payment system. Because I want to give you a assignment for chapter eight. It won't be a chapter eight and chapter seven. I'm going to give you an assignment for those two chapters. And like I said, we're, we're getting there. So um, I will try to see if I'm going to do the same process that I did with the um, review sheet for the final exam. I will see if I'm going to do the same thing. But payment and payment system, the theory of payment. It seems rather worrisome to suggest that there is a theory of payment that can have universal applicability, yet the data from different economies and legal system can indeed be reviewed and analyzed to determine key factors affecting payment system offered and used by banks. Um, Mr. or Ms. Mrs. Price, do y'all have, like, I know most banks now have a legal team or a, a, a lawyer on board. Do y'all have that at Scotia? Yes, we have a legal department. Okay, all right. Miss Russell, I always forget which, where you work, where you work now. Currently, I'm at Teachers um, Credit Union. However, I was at BOB up until um, May of this year, for the past six years. 
So you're a teacher's credit union now? Yes, ma'am, but I was a BOB. Okay, but at teacher's credit union, y'all, do y'all now have y'all own um, cards, like Visa credit cards like that? We're in the process of launching our debit cards, but they haven't been launched to the public as yet. Okay, because I know at one point, um, I guess y'all used another bank. Right, we used Fidelity. Fidelity, yes, I remember yes, that. Yeah, so y'all out, y'all getting rid of that and having your loan now? Yes, ma'am. So, because y'all have enough um, um, members that y'all should be able to do that. Yeah. The yes, importance of yeah, the importance of buying to global economy and to national and local well-being is evident by the fact that the World Bank regularly survey and report on the development of payment system emerging from the series of survey in the model outlined in figure 9.1 regulation consumer protection we know we say regulations are there to protect the consumer people buying customer traders technology check 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 chip pin internet mobile mobile markets into buying businesses non buying providers so that's the payment environment there every nation has a different environment and culture with with within which payment system develop in the uk for example the history of checks spanning more than 150 years is almost at the end in 2011 payment count payments council recognizing that only seven percent of the declining volume of checks were guaranteed by a card withdrew the check guarantee scheme limiting the accessibility of the checks from customers while the remaining significant pocket of consumers charities and businesses still rel relied on paper checks, however, it cannot pursue its original aim of withdrawing checks completely. Anyone of you familiar with check card? Yes, that was um, check card was used um, when you were writing a check so that the check um, could clear, I guess. That was a process that they used. Um, they, they don't have it anymore. Because, I, gee, I had a check card for my mother. was 18. Um, yeah, that's, that's been discontinued. Ms. Okay, because okay. I know um, when you go to write a check, you better have that check card. Ain't nobody taking no check from you unless you're a frequent and a good customer of a, of, of a business, you know. I like, you know, because you know, a lot of people is write them rubber check and so back in the days, but now they can't do it because because of the clearing system, checks clear right away, right away. So you know more kiting could go on where people kite and try to, you know, beat the system by saying, Oh, I have three days. What checking are we? No, no longer is that. You have to um actually ensure that the money on that account, or you better have an overdraft facility secured or unsecured with the bank where you um where you bank um where that check is um where you writing that check on yeah also check got discontinued oh okay yeah but that was something that most persons had um when they were writing a check and you go into the food store you go into any shop they actually wants um a check card um so that's discontinued now. Figure 9.2 provides a snapshot of non-cash payment in two developed, developed nations, Australia and Mosabi, uh, which highlighted significant difference in usage pattern. Australia, like the US state, is a society reliant on credit with e with excellent credit risk reference data held on customers and businesses. As we know, we 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 off the ground now with our getting our um Miss DeVoe, not sure you're able to say, are you in, with the credit credit rating, credit um rating department, credit score, 
Um, do y'all have a credit scoring like for customers? Um, no, actually a credit scoring is supposed to be implemented, I think in the latter part of 2024 for persons who are um, seeking to get loans and other things. And that'll be implemented through the banks. The banks will be mandated to do that. So, um, okay, the banks will be mandated to do that. So, because I know right now it's just a credit bureau where banks are able to see, some banks are using it, right? Like I, I think somebody say a Commonwealth, I know in my other class last year, she said Commonwealth was using it, the credit score, um, the credit um, bureau scoring, um, software so um we now it's not being customers are not getting a credit score it's just, right because it's not mandatory for them to i mean i don't know i, I it's not mandatory for mm -hmm. them to deny you of a loan based on it now because it's not implemented oh, okay so do you think, you think some banks still do though i think they still, yeah, they still do they still do based on the clients, um, you know, ratios, they, they still do, but it's not yeah. mandatory. They could, um, you know, make a complaint that they use the credit score and it's okay. not um, implemented as yet. Okay. Didn't know that. Okay. Australia also enjoy the latest technologies along with a good mobile phone coverage and a broadband internet access. Bank regulation is strong without limiting the effect, the efforts of banks to grow their markets. Australia population of almost 25 million is affluent and its economy is very developed. However, Australia is also vast with considerable geographical challenges and largely conservated population cluster in a handful of regions. The Australian environment gives rise to a large proportions of electronic payments and a large proportions of credit card transactions. Credit cards are widely held in credit information on consumers is debt. Checks retained a small market share, possibly owing to the demographic challenges to the scope of internet banking by contrast with zombie populations also of 25 million engage in a low level payment transaction. Checks are much in evidence in this conservation, conser conservative society as our credit transfers, payment cards, have a significant and growing populations of payments in both countries, cash remains a significant force. So we know, well, checks, um, a lot of people still write checks, some um, businesses, they still write checks. We have, um, you know, the government, they, that's how they pay a lot of their bills through checks. Um, companies, you know, we're not, I don't think a lot of companies are, um, quite up to the mark with saying, I'm doing an online transfer to pay you. No, I don't think, uh, you know, when they have a business accounts payable with companies, I think they, they just um, they just write checks or um, that's what they do. Most of them, that's what they do. Because you'll still see um, business owners come into the banks and bring checks, a lot of checks, you know, that they get from customers or, they still um, do manager's checks for payment of their bills or, you know, payment of purchasing items for, for the business. So checks are still, I think, will still be around for a while. A lot of businesses will not opt to that online banking transfer. I don't think they'll opt to that. Um, then we further go down to the qualities of retail payment system. 
Every retail payment system comprises three key parties, the customer, the trader, or the retailer, and, and the bank. To be acceptable, a payment system must provide benefits to each. So it's saying that the payment system has to be up to benefit the customer, the trader, the re or retailer, and the bank. Because we know like when we um, use our cards, we use the payment system, whatever we use, we, there's a fee. Banks, banks make, make profit of their fees that they charge customers for using. Because if I go to a, I have a Fidelity card and I go to a, a Scotia or Roy, or Royal to use it, I have to pay $3 and what, 56 cents, $3 and something. Anyway, anytime I do a transaction at another, at another bank, other than Fidelity, I have to pay $3 and something to actually do that transaction. So bank, that's where banks make their money from. Um, then further down, we have in brief, we have T-E-S-C-O. Numic stands for the time, the expense, the security, the convenience, and other attributes such as gold, intrigues, values. So we'll see table 9.1 shows that, and it tells us what time, when it says time, it gives an explanation. Then it says the customer, the retailer, the bank. So the framework to analyze cash as a payment system and, is illustrate, and illustrates why flexible and convenient cash is still consumer's favorite. Cash is always favorite. Cash, I mean, cash is the favorite, but then um, it's also good to carry your card. Well, nowadays you have cash or card, the people, if a robber wants something, they will make you go to the machine to get the money out of the machine. So, you know, everything like they say before is a risk. Everything is just a risk, yeah. So retailers and banks, however, are motivated to reduce the level of cash transactions in favor of automated payment and debit, and debit cards. Plastic cards generate faster and cheaper electronic payment methods when used in conjunction with electronic point of sale, EPOS terminal with, within retailers. This motivation as underpins the offers of cashback from retailers at the point of sale. So we'll see in 9.1, qualities of cash. You see time, time, the explanation for time is duration of the transaction, including the value of the date, the customer, loss of interest from point of drawing cash, but normally only small amounts, retailers, time consuming at checkout. And in terms of counting, storing and transmitting cash, Delay in, counter, in, counter, in counting, storing, transmitting, and redistributing cash. So it tells you, it, it gives you a breakdown to say that expense. It tells, it telling, it's telling you the explanation, what's happening with the customer, the retailer, and the buyer. So um, you can just go over this little um. This little chart, 9.1, 9 because you will see it again. It may not come in, it, it's going to come in the form where I say T-E-S-C-O. What does T stand for? What does C stand for? What does S stand for? What does O stand for? So stuff like that, you will have to explain what it is. Um, T is time, E is expense, S is security. And it tells you what it's all about. And I can either put it in a form that that is processing time as as well as value date. So I can put it in that, or I can ask you what TESCO means. Then we have key domestic payment system. In this section, we describe the key domestic consumer payment system that banks 
offered. In most economies, cash and debit cards are used for relatively small value transaction, while credit cards, checks, and direct transfers are used for those at higher value. We have already noted the likely denies of checks in the UK, but they are they but they do do remain popular for relatively large transaction direct credit, large salary payment, boost the average of the average value of this mechanism. Yes, because you know some banks have um they have like accounts with with a bank. Um, not banks, but some businesses have an account with the bank. And so what they would do, they use, they open up an account that actually totally deals with just their staff salary. So in, in them dealing with the staff salary now, they can actually do it where all persons don't have to get paid from one bank or everybody has to have a savings account at that bank because they can do um, transfers where salaries go on one pay um one pay slip to one bank to another pay slip to another bank but you're not like a lot of uh, a bank a lot of businesses don't have like their payroll so all their staff have accounts at this bank and every month the money is credited to each staff or every bi-weekly credited to each staff account from their um checking account or savings account Cash, for retail buying, cash is necessary, but costly payment mechanism to offer, which is shown in table 9.1. That for banks, the volume of cash required gives rise to security and transaction time issue. With the notable exceptions of Euro area, Cash is typically not acceptable outside a country border, um, which was discussed. But as we know with us, you know, we we have to use US. We can't go to Canada or the US or Barbados or Jamaica and use Bahamian dollars. So as we know, the US dollars is like is king because you can use US around the world. Conversion may be there, like in, in most of the Caribbean country, US, they're not on par. Their dollars is not on par with the US dollar. Unlike the Bahamas, we still hold that one to one. So that's a good thing. I go to Canada, Canada um, 7.6. So the US is, you know, way up there. Canada is 7.6 of the US dollars. We note that the acceptance of reserve currencies such as the US, when a domestic currency is devalued at a time of crisis, security and handling costs are the biggest headaches for the retail banks, and yet they cannot easily be passed on to the consumer, who have a high level of demand for cash and do not expect to pay for the privilege of withdrawing their own money from an ATM. In an effort to extend this durability and low, low long-term costs, central bank in the UK, Australia, and Singapore have already began to issue plastic banknotes. Oh, heard that one. Any of you heard about that? Plastic banknotes? And UK, Australia, and Singapore? I mean, you're, especially Mr. Price and Ms. Mrs. Price who work at uh, a, a Scotia Bank, which is an international bank. Have you all heard about that before? No, I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Okay, then we have checks, which we talked about before. A check can be defined as an instrument instruction and in writing to the bank wanting them to pay a third party so i write a check um to joe doe i said okay this is my account number um check for four thousand dollars um payable to joe doe i have to put in the dollar value put in the date make sure words and figure diff um doesn't differ make sure they're in agreement so if i say four thousand dollars my word in words 
my figures should also read 4,000. And we know a lot of times people, that's the issue. You get discrepancies where you have the customer will 4,000 in figures and then just write 4,000 and leave it like that. They don't say $4,000. So you have to ensure that's why um, CSRs have to ensure that when they take deposits that um, the words and figure doesn't differ. The signature is legible and, you know, and especially when you're cashing a check, you have to ensure. I don't think most banks do that cash and check anymore because what they do now is that they um, just, um, have where um you can't you can you can't even make deposit can you make deposit uh, deposit a check from another bank um at scotia mr price that is payable from a fidelity yeah you you can make um check deposits from other banks so it'll just be on hold for two days can you cash a check if you have that amount of money on your account? Are you are you al allowed to cash that check and the check is whole because you have sufficient funds on your account to cover it? I mean, technically, yeah, because what we we'll do, if you have sufficient funds, we'll just hold um, the check on the account for the two days, let that ride out, and then just give you the cash from the account. I know a lot of banks has changed a lot of stuff. That's why I'm asking because I remember being at Fidelity. A lot of things have changed because I think they didn't even allow you to come and deposit or cash a check from, a, from another bank. Yeah, I think they changed a lot of stuff. That's why I was asking if Scotia Bank had done that too. Checks were a popular method of payment in the 19th and the 20th centuries, initially locally, but then nationally, once transport networks offered secured and swift transmission in the UK, in the in in the UK, growth in payment by checks followed the expansion of railway railways, and in the 19th centuries and in the 20th centuries, road networks allowed the exchange clearing of checks via central location, initially landing overnight. And that's what I was talking about when I talk about a central location. It used to be the central bank. All the messengers used to meet and there they trade the check. Okay, this for okay. I I'm from Royal and I have stuff for Scotia. I have stuff for for um um CIBC or FCIBC. I have stuff for the credit union. So that's what used to happen back in the days. They used to all congregate at Central Bank and they do the exchange in the mail room. One room. They had one room that they all did the exchange. So all the messengers or persons who dealt with it would just go to Central Bank at a certain time. They had to be there and they just exchange checks, exchange um checks for whatever bank they have it for. As with cash checks give rise to costs and security consideration for retail banks, physical transaction of checks has been replaced by transact transmission of checks image as illustrated in figure 9.4. Yeah, do y'all still, I know most banks still, y'all still like when checks, y'all, do y'all still image checks when y'all get checks deposit for customers, Mr. Price? Yeah, we still image the checks um, when we get them. Yeah, that's still a practice. Okay, well, a lot of things still in place. I just been working, I guess, because I've been in the back office in for a while, I just trying to find out if these process that I used to do when I was in front line still in place. But the risk of fraud or miss, missing signature, incomplete or unclear written instructions or post dated checks remain there yeah, because, you know, a lot of times people give post-dated checks and 
People don't even check to see if, if it's a post date. They check on what they a check on what they do. They just put it through. And I think now with the actual um, clearinghouse now, it, it 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 isn't picked up because you have to know to say, hey, I write that was a post dated check. Please go check that. Why to check it in my account? So I think with with, with the actual now, um, how they do it with the automated clearinghouse now, it. If they don't actually pick up if the teller didn't pick it up on front line and the person doing the imaging or the um i guess the uploading of the checks to go to the different bank to go to the clearing house um it goes through and so unless you are a customer who actually know well hey i didn't write that check to go through now and you'd have to call the bank and say hey return that check because that check is post-dated because the, the bank teller, CSR, didn't pick it up. So you'd have check details sent to the bank. Details re read from check imaging and used to credit pay account. Bank sent detail to pay bank via share clearing system. Payer bank pays checks to collecting bank or collecting bank or payers, bank return check unpaid and collect bank debit payee account. Um, Mr. Price, um, a lot of times, why is it does check go, um, sometimes you would see a bank comes into another bank with um, a check and saying special settlement. Why does that happen? Um, I think uh, because of the amount of the, the item, um, the risk is greater. So what they wanna do is make sure that um, the funds are good before it's deposited. Um, it also makes for, uh, uh, it, it, it lessens the, the whole time, you know, okay. so that it wouldn't have to go through the clearance system. It's being cleared directly with that institution. Also, um, like if what amount, I know there's a special, a certain amount that um, cannot be transferred from another bank to another bank. It has to actually go through central bank account. The central bank account. I don't remember the name. Like sometimes customers' money is coming from another, uh, or, or say when persons want to purchase um bonds or stuff like that, and it has to go through central bank account, central bank clearing account. I, I can't remember the name. Mr. Bo, do you know anything about that? No, ma'am. I'm not. I'm not. Um familiar with that okay sorry I can't oh, what it is. mr mr price i i know what you're talking about right but i can't remember because that's not something that we do now we used to do that back in the day but i i know what it is that you're talking about i remember the name yeah I no what the name they call like uh, um mostly like government salary um the amount they have to go to the central bank account can't remember what it named but like a government salary and stuff like that they have to go through that to, to the to an account that to the central bank account and then um each bank have that account have a central bank account so it, it then then they would take it off there or transfer the money there yeah they can't remember right now i can't remember the name of it yeah but like you say to um, special settlement is because large amounts and you don't want to take the banks don't want to take the risk that the actual check can come back. And then a lot of times special settlements happen too because you probably put the check through before and it didn't go through. And so the person say, um, yes, I have the fund. So then, um, then you can put it through a special settlement by going to the actual bank because you're saying to me I, the fund should be there. So you know, then they do special settlement and walk to the other bank and clear the check, like you say. 
businesses business users prefer checks for reasons of convenience and because checks allow businesses to enjoy a float period not now which while a check is being cleared and before it is applied in a bank account a check also provides evidence of receipt and evidence of non-payment should it be returned yes and so we know a lot of people that have nsf for nsf not sufficient funds or you have a check um being returned because uncleared funds the funds was on hold for two days and you put the check to no you just put out a check and so the funds are no because the check you just deposited um the check is on hold so you'd have uncleared funds so you can't get the money until the check is you know so when somebody else come to present a check or put it through um the automated um the um ach um bottom line about it is because the funds weren't clear yet so it would be returned uncleared funds or nsf most likely it'll say uncleared nsf will be oh we don't have no money on the account or a check could be returned saying um account closed check could be returned like i say for post dated so yeah but like they say a lot of times people prefer checks but also it's a good thing and a bad thing because it here again it's know your customer and if you know the person and the person is always giving you checks you know they're good for it even if something happened you know they're going to come and pay that's different but then you have new persons just coming to write a check nope they don't that, that don't work a lot of a, a lot of this i know one business i saw it said that um this is our account um if you want to order supplies building supplies from us this is our online account you can credit the money there and then you know we, you could come in and place the order but they don't know send nothing out unless they see that money is cleared there has been deposited to there then we have the debit cards debit cards were introduced in the 1980s and are fast becoming the payment mechanism payment mechanism payment mechanism of choice in face-to-face -face phone and internet-based transaction. Debit cards also function as cash, cash cards in ATM, depending on the global card system adopted by the issuing bank, for example, MasterCard or Visa card. They can also be used internationally. And so we know as long as the card has what on the back, Cyrus, um, you could use it in the ATM machine around the world, you know, Visa, and like a MasterCard now becoming a big thing. As a method of payment, the debit card acts in the effect as a reusable check for any amount. Originally, debit cards operated on the basis of magnetic strip technology and required verification of most transactions by customer signature. As with checks, however, fraud became a relatively easy, and so banks have to devise new systems to prevent losses. Now retailers are electronically linked to the bank so that they can obtain online authorization from higher level payments, access details of the latest stolen card, and send transaction electronically, allowing account balances to be updated properly. In this way, the debit card can can be taken from the customer's account in, in, instant, in instantaneously. In this regard, American Express are pioneers, experts system to highlight usual, unusual transactions as a method of combating fraud. The success and hence widespread uptake, uptake of these system means that a word of caution is a pop. It is important to notify your bank if you do intend to use your card when traveling abroad. If the bank's computer system detects unusual behavior, that is payment of 
amounts significantly larger than normal payments made in unusual location or increased frequently of you, they can block transactions as many of us has found out to our embarrassment. Has this happened to any of you? You can tell the bank you are going somewhere and now you're using your card in the US and they know you was here in the Bahamas and you're using the US and you didn't tell them. And then like it says for larger transactions more than usually at your account, have any of you had that happen to you? I've seen it often to customers all the time. It never happened to me because I work in the bank. So I know that whenever I travel out of the country, um, you have to put an ad advisory on your, your debit or credit card. Yeah. But even sometimes too, when the actual, um, the system isn't working and you, you, you know you have money on your account and you're right here in, in, in Nassau and you know you have money on your account and what happens? Um, you go to a, a Wendy's and you order something for $10 and the system ain't working. So uh, the cash, in the, oh, the card was declined. And you know, they can say it hard for everybody to hear. The card was declined. And who are you looking at yourself? Be like, hold on, decline? But I have money. And so sometimes too, when the system is down or the system is not working properly, that happens too. And that's an embarrassment also. And figure 9.5 illustrates the key features of a typical debit card, the security digits on, this, on the signature strip and the card are used in phone and internet transaction. The latter are also protected by se separate security checks carried out by the card issuers. The microchip technology in a combination with the personal identification pin appeared to have halted the steady rise in crime in card fraud, but criminals still find ways in which to bypass the system adopted. And so eternal vigilance is needed by both banks and customers. Use of smartphones and pre-authorized ATM transactions is an attempt to combat card cloning. But this protection is not yet available for online transactions. Have anyone had issues when you did an online transaction that um, it's duplicated or um, a purchase that you didn't do? Have any one of you had that situation? Hello? Yeah, that happens from time to time um, with the duplicated transactions. Um, you find a lot of times, you know, the merchant machine may may have malfunction, right? Mm -hmm. So on their end, transaction didn't go through. So they swipe again. And then on the customer statement, you have two of the same transaction, you know, that would have gone through. So what happens then? Y'all inform the customer? and then reverse the transaction? Well, in most cases, the customer bringing it to your attention is the banker. So um, but what we tend to do is um, we let them, we refer them back to the merchant. You know, mm -hmm. we'll provide them with their state. It was duplicated. So what that tells us is that the, the merchant would have received the funds twice, even though their machine may have showed an error. Um, right on our end, the money east of them. Right. So as we see, right. So we see that you'd have a card, and you could have something like this in an exam. Um, you'd see the card, the issuer, the microchip, and you'd see all the different features on the card. So I could easily say um, the security code. 
the magnetic strip, the card holder name, um, you know, I could just put stuff in and actually what that represent, what should be there. Um, then we have credit cards. Um, credit cards was introduced in the US in the 1940s and was issued to Pacific purposes, for Pacific purposes, including purchases, fuel, airfares. In the 1950s, the charge card diner club was unveiled. This granted no credit to the holders, but Pioneer along with American Express, the technology and clearing arrangement between retailers, retailers, banks, and cardholders that are commonplace today. So I don't know. American Express, I know that 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 is a card that and that bill come, you better pay that whole bill. And like like when you get them. Um, credit card now, you get one monthly bill. Boy, when that American Express card coming, that bill is 10 grand. You better have that 10 grand to pay that bill off. Yeah, so a lot of people nowadays don't even accept American Express right here in, in Nassau, in the Bahamas. You'd see on their door, they'd say, We don't accept American Express, or you'd see somewhere by their cashes, We don't accept American Express. So, the, break, the breakthrough for modern credit card came in 1958 with the launch of Bank America Card, the first plastic card backed by a revolving credit facility. This was franchised and copied around the world and became the foundation for Visa. The UK saw the first credit card in 1967 when Barclays launched its Barclays card using computer system developed by Bank of America. In 1972, the Access Credit Card was launched by joint, by joint credit card company, JCCC, owned by Lloyds, Midland, and NatWest. Since then, Access Card has been offered by Royal Bank of Scotland and Bank of, Bank of Ireland. Anybody knows about NatWest Bank? You know, we used to have a NatWest branch here. Any of you know about that? It used to be Roy West, NatWest. It used to be out west, just where the prime minister office is. Any of you know of that? They all do, yeah. Um, no, you never heard of that bank before. No? No, I'm not familiar with it either. Yeah, we used to be, it used to be NatWest, Roy West, NatWest used to be located right where the prime minister office is, yeah. Okay, can someone else read for me, please? Start by local schemes. No volunteers? Ms. Russell? Oh. Local schemes also exist in different regions, but the main global players are based in the United States or Japan. That is Visa, MasterCard, Diners Club, American Express, and JCB, formerly the Japanese Credit Union Bureau. From a technical and security perspective, credit cards are the same as debit cards. The inclusion of a revolving credit facility distinguishes the credit card business model, which can be lucrative for issuers. Credit card banks derive their income from the commission charged to retailers and others, such as hotels and insurance brokers, who accept the cards in payment of sales, the interchange fee that is paid to the card issuer, and the interest charged to those cardholders who do not repay their balance in full within a set number of days of the date shown on their monthly statement. Table 9.2 offers some illustrative typical fees for a card transaction. Using these fees as an example, we can calculate that the eventual cost to a cardholder normally, normally resident in the UK of an SG $100 transaction in a shop in Singapore could be SG $100 plus interest, with the retailer receiving only SG $98 at SG $100 if a 2% 
be as charged. Moreover, credit card transactions are subject to limits. For example, merchants, that is, retailers or outlets that accept payment by credit cards may have a limit of US $50 per transaction beyond which they cannot accept a card without authorization by the card issuer. This is normally granted online, can be by phone. Cardholders have higher limits, for example, USD, $10,000, which is their total balance, you must not see it at any one time. A credit card can be flexible, can be a flexible method of payment and repayment. Each month, a cardholder receives a credit card statement, which offers them a range of repayment options from repaying the balance in full by a certain date, in which case they will often be charged no interest to making only a minimum repayment. In the UK, that minimum is required to be equivalent to all of the interest for the month plus sufficient capital to repay the balance within three years, which is an effort to reduce the persistent high levels of credit card debt in the country. The cardholder may choose to repay any amount between that maximum and the minimum in any month. Interest is charged monthly on the outstanding balance. Should the amount not be repaid in full, it is calculated from the date of each transaction. Figure 9.6 illustrates the flow of data and funds in a credit or debit card transaction. It should be noted that the merchant acquirer may be the retailer's bank or may be an outside provider, another bank. Since this type of service can be independent of the main banking relationship. For the vigilant customer, then credit cards are convenient and cheap. However, the ease with which credit cards can be granted together with the temptation of 0% balance transfer offers and the ability to hold multiple cards was among the contributory factors to the risk, to the fragility of the US and UK economies in the aftermath of the 2007-2008 global financial crisis. As the subsequent credit crunch took hold, consumers struggled to repay their credit card debt and the numbers of insolvencies and of those using debt repayment programs soared. On mobile phone payment, we know we have several companies where you know, where we can pay our bills over the phone. We have like we, we have like a BPL. We can call in and use our credit card, our debit card, and we can pay our bill over the phone. Um, but call a water and sewage and do the same thing, a cable for harmless and do the same thing. So um, we can use our the mobile banking and use our credit or debit card to pay our bills. Um, then we looked at, I'm not gonna go into, you can read that um, session, but I wanna talk about automated payment. There are three key automated payment rules, and we have a standing order, a direct debit, or a fine bio credit. Now, I know with um, standing orders, a lot of times with standing orders, this happens when people have insurance. So I have insurance, so I, I, I would have a pre-authorized, and I think the buy charge, well, before I know this would be 15, I don't know how much it is, Mr. Price, um, do you all do standing orders pre-authorized for insurances? Or some people do it for school fees? Um, we, we typically, um, we do standing orders for like credit card payments or for uh, pre-authorized savings or something like that. Um, we rarely get, pers we rarely are person to um, set up standing orders for another bank. So, but like I say, um, collectively standing orders and debit and direct debits are known as pre-authorized payments because they are set up by the customer in advance and normally for regular payments. The key difference between the two methods is that standing orders are originated by the customer, customer's bank, which sends funds to the amount to the account of the beneficiary, while direct debits are originated by the beneficiary by making a claim on the bank account of a customer. The customer pays the claim provided that it has a clear authority 
mandated for the customer to do so. So like, yeah, because you could have um, pre-authorized payments set up for loan payments where, or every month it comes off and goes to the mortgage account or every month it comes off and goes for a savings, like you said, Mr. Price. With standing orders, the bank received the order. Receiving the order has to take care to establish whether or not the amount to be paid changes from time to time and whether there is a date after which payments are to cease. Standing orders can be altered only by the customer in writing. Example of a regular payment for, for which standing orders might be used includes annual subscription, life assurance, premium, monthly and quarterly rent and mortgage repayment. The advantage of direct debits in comparison with standing orders are that <clears throat> the beneficiary is aware of every transaction so that there are no unapplied credits that can cannot be traced. Most debits are paid by the customer's bank with only a small minority being returned for lack of funds. And if the debit is for a variable amount, and many are, the amount can be increased in line with rising costs. Safeguards are built into the system to prevent people from initiating direct debits that are unauthorized or for excessive amount. All originators must be approved by their banks and must give an indemnity to reimburse the customer and the customer's bank for incorrect debit. For example, where a payment is accidentally processed twice, a, fur a further safeguard is that every originator must give adequate notice to the customer of the forthcoming changes in the amount of the direct debit. So if before I um, used to pay um, $800 and what happened, my payment gone up to 825, but I was not notified that, hey, my payment changed. So this amount will be coming off my 825 instead of 800 coming off my account. So me as a customer, I am going straight into the bank and I will be like, hold on, I authorize this amount. Why is this amount coming off? And so you have to get, the customer have to be aware of what is happening before you just go out and just increase it and not ensure that the customer knows the amount which will be debited to their account. The disadvantage arises mostly in relation to variable amounts, direct debits. Some customers do not check their statements regularly and so may be unaware of the rising subscription rate, like, like, like they say, I, I decided that I'm gonna get a subscription from um, People's Magazine. So if the rate went up, but I didn't know. If they were to change the standing order, they would be altered to increase and more over might cancel the, the subscription. This disadvantage from a customer's standpoint is of course an advantage of the originating organization, bank IO credit. That is bank credit transfer electronically are a major part of internet and direct banking. The bank holds the detail of people an organization to whom regular payments are made and customers trigger these at will, often adding the amount to be paid via internet or phone connection with the bank. Any questions, any concerns, anything to add? Y'all are so quiet, I told you. This is the second half, now y'all have to actually be interacting. I know we all are so tired, but... We all have to interact and talk and, you know, that's what I need to see the second part of our class. Other domestic payment mechanism. 
For the sake of completeness, this section simply lists and describes several other payment mechanisms available via bank and building societies, bank drafts, which we know a bank draft, go into the bank. How much you have to pay for a draft now? Um, if it's if it's paid to you, do you still have to pay for uh, have to pay for it, or what is the price if you, if the draft is being paid to someone else, Mr. Price? It's a standard price across the board. Um, I believe it's eleven dollars and forty cents now. It used to be about six dollars back in the day. It's six dollars and twenty five cents now. It's eleven dollars and forty cents. Get a check. Yeah, to get a draft. Okay, what what about if I wanted to wire transfer money to, uh, say, a customer in Canada who have a Scotiabank account? Um, you know, like well, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. A wire transfer is more than a, a local Bahamian dollar draft. You got to factor in the interest rate. I mean, the Canadian rate would be much lower. Eh? Um, yeah. But from a fee standpoint, um, it's $30 for the wire transfer, international transfer, if I could remember clearly. Um, plus, you know, the government sundry fees and um, taxes on conversion and all that. Oh, gee, that's a lot of dollars. Even though it's a, a yard branch in, the, in, in Canada? <laughs> yeah, I'm hardly paying for the service. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so a lot of people prefer to say I go in to buy a car. I I I give you a manager's check or you know, um, but see a lot of times people don't even do their due diligence because if I'm buying a car, I definitely take in that car to the mechanic first. If you want to sell me the car, you can sell it to me. But I gotta get the mechanic. You have to get a car to the mechanic shop, and the mechanic gotta look at that and say, "Yeah, it's a go." And then I will either issue that check to you, or I'll do that um, online transfer to your account. So, like I say, a lot of people prefer to do a check, um, something as you know, in their hands. Even though an online transfer is the same or wire transfer is the same, you have actual evidence right in your hand, or just pull up your account. The Clearinghouse Automated Payment System, which is CHAP, which we have the Clearinghouse too, but it's a different name. It's the Bahamas Automated Clearinghouse. So B-A-C-H. B-A-C-H, yes. So, this is issued for large domestic payments that requires same day credit of the beneficiary account. Trans transfers to complete home purchase often use a series of check payment to effect the transaction. So like I say, back home here, we have BASH, we have B-A-C-H, which is also, this is our Bahamas Automated Clearinghouse. So, we also have that here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to send you all this chapter with BACH, but for now I'll talk about it. Bahamas Automated Clearinghouse. Bahamas Automated Clearinghouse, BACH, went live in Jan on January 22nd, 2010. The automated clearinghouse is a system authorized by the U.S. government that involves the financial environment, which is a network of web-linked banks, makes electronic wire transfers possible. With the presence of the automated clearinghouse, it is easy for people to deposit cash and issue checks for businesses and personal consumption. Recently, Brian, well, it used to be Brian Smith, um, I don't know who it is now. It used to be Brian Smith, who used to actually be, he was the one who started, headed the clearinghouse when they started in 2010. The business, uh, Brian Smith, the business manager of Bahamas ACH, was featured in a local news because of pending utilization of ACH 
within the Caribbean islands. Smith is, in this interview, emulated some of the major advantages the people of the island can get from the automated clearinghouse in the island in terms of both personal, business, financial transactions. These are as follows. Advantage of using the automated clearinghouse for Bahamas, the first advantage of utilizing the ACH is the quickening of all banking transactions to mere minutes. This is because of the automated and electronic nature of the said transaction with the use of internet and secure cyber banking protocols you will be able to transfer money from one account to another without the hassle of much paper. Secondly, the Bahamas Bash will ensure that your money is safe and secure through the aforementioned protocol that only the BACH bank network knows about. These protocols are limited to those banks that have direct linkage to the network to enter banking transactions. And like we have, I think it's about seven banks who signed on with um, BACH. So if you, you, you weren't a part of the BACH um, members, if you were not a member or part of it, you were not able to have um, access to the linkage, the network for the um, inter-banking transaction. Aside from this, you can now receive money from a different bank account, from your employer account. If you need to, even if you have an account with a different financial institution, this means that you do not need to have an account at your employer's bank to be paid. As stated above, BACH will greatly reduce banking transaction hours, transfer duration, you would not have to wait for weeks for your deposit to reach the proper account. Because of the fast wire transfers, you will be able to send and receive cash within days of your withdrawal or deposit. The ACH should also reduce the risk or danger of danger when physically transporting a check from one bank to another. This will be much safer for the messenger and the bank itself. The messenger will not how to worry about shady characters and having the cash or check stolen from, from him. These are just some of the major advantage of VACH for all your business transactions. The automated clearinghouse is a prime example of how far technology can take us in terms of financial security and safety. In addition, VACH has become so widely utilized by banks all over the world, ACH has become so widely utilized by banks all over the world that e-commerce has decided to tap into this as well. The National Automated Clearinghouse Association has decided to set up a specific guideline as to proper way, as a proper way to conducting online banking transactions to protect consumers as well as merchants. Nature, that's what it is, nature. Nature will disseminate these guidelines in more. Talk about it, they were, that was in 2010. And that's when Wendy Craig was the governor of the Central Bank. Um, she confirmed that this, this um, new feature will be coming online. These guidelines aim to strengthen the security of each transaction through digital signature and encryption program that can help protect the identity of the client and aid the bank's authorizations that client's identity is before proceeding with the transaction. So like I said, I talked before and said that, you know, now it's no longer that you have to say, oh, I could write a check, the checking, get it to do this. Now, can you write a check, you deposit it, to your bank, your bank do an upload, whether it's you, you get a debit card, 10, 10, 10, 30, they do the upload at 11, it goes through in that trans, that, that load and it goes into the different banks. Then they do another upload, I think it's two or two thirty, and then the last upload is at four or four thirty. So it's three times a day. And so if you write a check or you make a deposit 
for your salary was to be, be, be deposited to your account um, as long as your, um, your employer ensures that it's there, it automatically goes to your account within one of those scheduled 11 to 430. ACH also plans to tap into the internet pay, paying service like PayPal to decrease the risk of bouncing checks, incidents, and payment that clients fail to receive. With ACH collaborating with these online financial institutions, banking transactions would be much easier. Major financial institutions linked to BACH, here are some of them. You have in the in 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 in, in the Bahamas. You have Bank of the Bahamas. You have Commonwealth Bank, Fidelity Bank, Royal Bank, Scotia Bank, First Caribbean. So all of these banks are a part of the a bash. I don't know if any others join. Um, Miss Russell, do you know if the credit union is a part of of BACH? At the moment, we are currently not. However, that that will change in the upcoming weeks because we are in the process of becoming a member of the BACH. Okay. Central bank regulates the network banks, which ensures smooth banking transactions within the network. With BACH within your reach, your financial stance will be better than before. So. This is chapter eight, chapter eight and nine. And so what I will do, I will send you all my portion with BACH. Um, so you all will have that because that's a part of the assignment that I will send to you. It won't be tonight. It will be by tomorrow evening. I'll send it to you. And like I said before, Persons who paper I have marked, I will send you all the result. But like I say, it's tentative because I have to go back over them to ensure that um, I captured everything correctly. Um, so I will send your results to you. Like I said, there's two more persons who have to actually take the exam. So. I will say, I, I don't give you back your papers. If you, I, I will tell you the ones you get wrong, but um, I still have two more persons who has to take the exam. So I will give you your results, um, let you know how much you got. Like I said, for the papers that I've marked so far, nobody has failed, nobody has gotten a 64. So yeah. Alrighty. Any questions? Any concerns? Anything you want to add to these two chapters? No, ma'am. Um. Questions. Miss Price. Mrs. Price. I, me, and you. Um, you should be good with this. This credit appraisal in chapter ten. Uh, chapter ten. So I, I, I look forward to hearing you um, help me out in this chapter. That's the deal? Sure, no problem. Yeah. So if there are no questions, no concerns, we finished two chapters tonight. So I think we have three more chapters to go on credit, Credit appraisal is a good chapter. It talks about loans, some um, gap, yeah, so the lending cycle, the principle of lending. It talks about the, the different um, characteristics they use when um, they actually qualifying somebody for a loan. It talks about the security that is whole, talks about interest, commission, talk about the weakness of the camp, Campari, it's Campari and ICE, talks about the personal credit scoring. And so I think chapter 10 is very interesting. And chapter 11 deals with buying security. And that also is a part of the loans. 
gives you the disadvantage and the advantage of not taking security. It talks about um, the different type of security. As we know, with some loans that like we talked about before, you have um, you have people can use stocks and for stocks and shares. We can have a guarantee, life insurance. These are securities that can be held. You know, so I think chapter going forward will be, and then um, the last chapter, recovery of money, which probably deals with debts. You know, debt service. Uh, debts and uh, costs are uh, uh, non-performing loans, loans that have become non-performing loans be where you have to become active charge off or charge off. Um, so um, nowadays we have a lot of loans like we talked about earlier in class that where persons just give out whether they was government salary deductions or not, they've gone. So you know, it has to be when the person come back. So we have three more chapters to um, go through, okay? So if there are no questions, no concern, we, I, like I said, I will send you your results for the papers that I've marked. I will send the results to you. Okay, good night. And I will also send chapter eight to you dealing with the ACH, Ready? Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh God, I am so tired. I feel like a tractor. Oh, I Oh, you better go to sleep, but I need to sleep. You better go to sleep.
And I still die. That's why I said earlier, though. I don't even know what I was. Yeah. That's a long day, boy. We did two chapters. Yeah, but sleep for two hours. She sleep? Yeah. So that that here about to go sleep, and you let her go sleep? No, I was we oh. fell asleep together. <laughs> I see shit. It's supposed to be one thing I'm on. I look at the side of my name, a stone cold. <laughs> Am I right next to this house full of just like this? I got it.
Oh, I'm so tired. And you better go to your bed. You don't go on your daddy will go sleep. I better go to sleep and then burn. I'm ready to go to my bed. Go on your daddy will go sleep.
Yeah, baby. Boy, you have upset stomach feet. You do much craziness. I've upset stomach feet. You do much craziness today, yeah? What do you have? Hey, look, your stomach hurt you. We can craziness. Oh, my God. I just ate a healthy food. Yeah, but I'm not going to eat that.
That's good. You you having a better relationship with your sister. Thank you. 